Well, thank you for the gospel reading. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. Happy Sabbath. You know, all the way back on February 17, we began this sermon series, The Journey to the Cross, and we've invited you in various ways to deepen and renew your commitment to the Lord through uh, fasting and prayer and repentance. And I know that I have seen the fruits of that in my own life, and I know that many of you have uh, as well. Uh, those of you who have participated in our programs on Wednesday night and Friday night uh, have, I hope, reaped the benefits of, of what we've been doing here. But we've called this the journey to the cross because this, is a t- this time of spiritual renewal culminates next Sabbath with Easter weekend, where we remember and celebrate the death and resurrection of the Lord. And so for the past several weeks, we've been looking at these different gospel readings that Uh, in one way or another, foreshadow or anticipate the cross. You see, all along the way, as Jesus is preaching to the crowds or speaking with his disciples, he is indicating implicitly or sometimes very explicitly the kind of death that he will die. But perhaps what is most important is that the cross is always presented to us as an invitation. The journey to the cross, the journey towards Jerusalem, is one that Jesus invites us to join. So he says, for instance, if anyone would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow after me. You see, so the journey to the cross is not something that we watch Jesus do from a distance, but it is a journey in which we join Jesus. Now, this gospel reading this morning, we finally come to this climactic moment because Jesus has been saying for so long that we are going to Jerusalem and there the Son of Man will be betrayed and crucified. And now Jesus has finally arrived. Jerusalem is finally here. But you see, he doesn't come quietly. He enters Jerusalem with this kind of makeshift parade. And I want to ask the question this morning of why is that? And it's because I believe Jesus is inviting us to join in the procession. The journey to the cross is not a path to be traveled alone, but we, the body of Christ, we live this journey uh, again and again. Like pilgrims in the Holy Land, we walk ourselves through these stories year after year so that we, the body, might become more like the head who has gone before us into Jerusalem. He has gone before us into the cross. He has gone ahead of us into death and darkness so that he might forge the path and blaze the trail into eternal life. So now, in our own lives, when we face death and darkness, which we will, we have no need to fear because we don't travel this path alone, but we march triumphantly through the grave because Jesus has gone before us. That's my whole sermon. (laughs) Uh, I know that wouldn't be satisfying, so we'll go a little bit longer, but not much longer, okay? So the the one thing that I really want to sort of draw out from the gospel reading this morning is uh, when we look at the story, we notice that this celebration, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, didn't just happen spontaneously. Jesus intended for this to happen, and with the help of his disciples, he coordinated it. I think sometimes when we hear or read this story, we might get that impression that this is something that the crowds just of their own accord uh, decided to do. It was this kind of spontaneous celebration. But as we see, the whole thing is, in fact, Jesus' idea. Mark tells us, when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, 
and will send it back immediately. So, first of all, the thing to know is the distance between these locations is about a mile and a half, okay? So Jesus is not sending for transportation because the journey is long and difficult. It's not. He's basically already there. I mean, coming from his hometown in Galilee, I mean, you have already arrived. But now he goes and he sends the disciples forward to fetch this colt. And this exchange that he tells the disciples to have is, I think, very telling. If someone asks you what you're doing, just tell them, the Lord needs it, and we'll be coming back this way immediately. What effect do you suppose that would have? You think that would pique people's curiosity? You think friends and neighbors might start kind of poking their heads out to see who it is that is uh, claiming to uh, be the Lord proceeding into Jerusalem? So Jesus, I think, very intentionally, quite clearly, is creating a bit of a scene. He is orchestrating this event. But most provocative of all is what he sends for. Not a war horse or a stallion, but the foal of a donkey, as some of the evangelists will put it. This story is often referred to as the triumphal entry, but as even our children's story this morning pointed out, I hope you realize the irony in the story is that this is the most untriumphal entry you could possibly imagine. His coming in on a donkey like this is intentionally comedic because it's the exact opposite of what you would expect from anyone who's taking themselves seriously. You see, Jesus doesn't come in with a sign of strength, but precisely with a sign of weakness. And I think the early Christians understood the subtext of this passage um, because we see even in the earliest works of Christian art, when this scene is pictured, uh, Jesus is often depicted as riding side saddle, which is something that would happen either uh, for someone who has been injured or perhaps a woman. It's the opposite of what you would expect from an emperor or a warrior. Jesus is not coming in strength, but the Christians understand that this scene is a manifestation of God's uh, weakness. So this whole scene, I believe, can and should be read as a kind of political satire. Because Pilate or Caesar would be riding in with a war horse and chariots and soldiers with their weapons, but Jesus comes in on a baby donkey with peasants and farmers waving sticks and branches. The whole thing is a, is a joke, and it's supposed to be a joke. It's a mockery of military power. Because, you see, in the Hebrew Bible, God, time and time again, tells the people of Israel not to trust in horses, not to trust in chariots or swords or spears or bows and arrows. 500 years prior to this, 500 years before Christ, the prophet Zechariah wrote these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, the prophet Zechariah understood and foretold that the king that God had chosen will not come to you with a show of strength and power, but humbly riding on a donkey. So he goes on to write, he, that is this king on a donkey, will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This humble and non-violent king, the prophet says, will destroy the power of the chariot and the war horse. This king will break the battle bow, and he will bring peace to the whole world. 
This untriumphal entry is a way of expressing or demonstrating that God's way of peace triumphs over violence. It's not weapons of war, but love itself that conquers the world. And we, when we can see this Palm Sunday procession in this light as a celebration of weakness and foolishness and poverty, then we can see that this scene itself is a foreshadowing of the cross. Because, again, I think we might have a tendency to be sort of puzzled by the events of Holy Week. How is it that Jesus can be so popular on one day and the very next he is being handed over to be crucified? But if we understand this story properly, we realize that the triumphal entry and the crucifixion have at their center the very same point. The same point that runs throughout the gospel, what lies at the heart of Christianity. The Bible expresses it in different ways, but the point is always the same. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. The first will be last, and the last will be first. All of these sayings from Scripture summarize that most basic and elemental idea of Christianity. It's what Paul refers to as the message of the cross. He puts it to the Corinthians this way. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He goes on to say, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, the things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. And you see, this is where it all becomes very practical. Because God delights in using the weak and the poor and the powerless. So the paradoxical advice given by Jesus is this. Whoever wishes to be great among you must become your servant. And whoever would be first must become your slave. So this morning I plead with you as Paul pleaded with the Ephesians to put away from yourselves all bitterness and wrath and anger, wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The more we give way to rivalry and envy and competition, the more our lives will be lost. The harder we fight to climb to the top, the faster we'll find ourselves on the bottom. The key to happiness, the key to a life of joy and peace and fulfillment is to live a life in service to others. And every time the church comes together in worship, we remind ourselves of this and we reorient our lives to correspond to God's upside-down kingdom. Because after all, what is it that we do here every week? What is it that we do week after week? And what is it that Christians have been doing for thousands of years? But when we come together, we sing songs of praise and worship to a man who was hung on a tree and left for dead. Nothing could be more absurd and foolish on the face of it. And that's just the way God would have it. Because therein lies the genius of Christianity. God opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. And so if you want to be close to God, don't put your trust 
in wealth. Don't defend yourself with weapons. Don't rely on your own strength in life. Instead, you must learn to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So we join with this festive procession, those who spread their cloaks on the road and those who spread palm branches that they had cut in the fields. And with them we call out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So I invite you to raise your voice in praise to Jesus, this servant king, as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 230, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.